on this uh, Zoom update. Um, hope everybody is is well, um, keeping okay. Um, as we're going to follow the kind of um, the general kind of way we've we've been doing these um, in the in the past over the last what is it seven months eight months now, um, and um, so if you can uh, keep yourselves on on mute uh, please, um, and obviously if you want your um, if, if you want your uh, video off, that's that's fine. Um, if it's on, you may end up on the recording because we're, we're recording this and making it available to people who can't join us uh, live. Um, if you've got questions, we do have one pre-submitted question that we'll, we'll come back to later. Um, but if you do have questions, if you can use the chat function uh, for that, um, that, would be, um, that would be helpful and we'll pick up questions um, as we as we move move through, um, so I'm going to give um, a quick update just around kind of where we are in light of the new uh, government restrictions that have come in, and I'll ask um, Helen Eccles and Darian Rosenthal to just pick up any other issues um, that that uh, that I will no doubt miss um, around around all of that, and then we'll pause at that point to see if there's any questions um, or. or um, kind of need for clarification around all of that. Um, and then Heather Graham is going to um, remind us all of some of the wellbeing resources uh, and support that's available um, across the university for, for staff. And um, then we'll do a quick update around where we are on uh, student numbers. Okay, um, so uh, just to give an overview of where we are, obviously, um, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's Tuesday, but uh, who knows what the latest guidance is. Um, so uh, as people will be aware, um, the Prime Minister announced uh, the, um, the new government restrictions, which apparently are not a lockdown, even though that's what all the media is calling it, um, uh, on Saturday evening. Um, but importantly said that there are um, essential areas which include universities exempt from those new restrictions that have been put in place. So essentially um, what that means for our uh, kind of key um, academic activities is that there isn't much change that we are proposing as a result uh, of, of those um, new announcements on Saturday. We will um, remain open um, as a campus. Obviously, we were never closed in terms of the work that people have been, been doing, um, although from home and from campus. And we'll continue with our mix of online and face-to-face, uh, -face, a blended learning approach um, as part of the, uh, the DFE Tier 3 guidelines that we're already undertaking. Um, so obviously, that will continue with the blended approach. Um, and we're not expecting that we will close any of the um, spaces that are open at the moment to our, to our students. Um, and that includes the library and the learning spaces which are already open and we're looking at how we can make more spaces available because we are getting quite a lot of um, demand for learning spaces, particularly in and around the library, uh, for students wanting to, to come in. Um, and, and have that, that quiet space um, and, and shared space to, to learn in. Um, we'll also continue with our research, although there are some um, areas of kind of face-to-face -face, um, patient and um, participant facing research that we're going to have to look at, but each of those is subject to a, risk, to a risk assessment that's signed off at school level and we will continue to uh, to look at what's appropriate to do and, and what's not. Um, and we're expecting that this will now continue until the 2nd of December, which is um, obviously the point where there's going to be the um, review of the, the national position. We were expecting a local assessment to be done um, at the end of this week, given the um, the, the, the particular kind of conditions in Greater Manchester, but um, our understanding is that that's now been kind of superseded by the national um, position. It is still not clear what's going to happen beyond that. Obviously, the government will take a view about what's going to happen beyond 2nd of December. There is still a discussion going on with government about whether 
um, all universities should stop teaching two weeks before Christmas to give students that two week break to enable them to go home before at, at Christmas. That is still under active discussion. So again, you know, things are as they are, but you know, as they've been for, for the last eight months, things are incredibly still up in the air. Um, and we'll we'll give people updates as soon as we're available. But um, that that's kind of the situation that that we're in. One thing that is has been made very clear um, by the government guidance, and we are expecting some more government guidance for universities in the next um, few days, is that students have been asked not to move backwards and forwards between university and home during term time. So that we are expecting them if they live in yeah, the university accommodation or a, a student flat or house that they should remain there i know we've had some issues around students that have been on reading weeks over the last week who've been home and are kind of now saying should i come back should i not come back um essentially they really should be here um if at all possible um so that that's the advice that that we're um that we're giving obviously that will be um localized to to program areas um in terms of things that will change um our indoor sports facilities will close from thursday catering outlets will only be offering a takeaway service um and the museum art gallery and jodrell bank are all going um to close um, so what that means in terms of, of, of working arrangements is that essentially things stay as they are. Um, if you are, unless you're currently required by your line manager to work on campus, you should continue to work from home. Um, we know that there are some people who um, are either clinically vulnerable or um, shielding or have other members in their household who, who are vulnerable and um, if you've got any concerns about the position that you're in or that you're expected to be on campus and you're concerned about vulnerability recognizing that we have made campus as covid secure as it's possible as it's possible to do to support the safety of our staff but if you are concerned um, about your personal position please speak to your line manager about that and we will um, make an assessment about uh, about what's what's appropriate recognizing that obviously people are are concerned about the ongoing um, situation. Um, obviously, in terms of if you do need to come onto campus, getting here and back, um, there's a clear view that public transport should only be used uh, for essential travel. We Just a reminder that we have uh, continued to suspend uh, charges for on-campus car parks until January. So um, there isn't a charge for bringing uh, your car um onto onto campus um and just to um just reiterate really that um we are doing all we can to continue to try and ensure that we're as covid secure um as as possible um on campus and supporting that obviously with um enhanced um cleaning and risk assessments that have been undertaken for uh, for every area um that is that is open uh, to staff and and students um, so that's all I want to say really by way of overview. Helen, is there anything to add from a, a teaching and learning student perspective? Uh, so I think the, the main things are covered. I, I think I'd say that um, in terms of the continuing kind of DfE tier three, where we are prioritising our clinical practical teaching and face-to-face -face activity around labs where it's critical to delivering our intended learning outcomes, um, one of the things that's really key for us is that we make sure that we have kind of auditable um, tracks and then trails of those decisions. Um, we've been very clear through the teaching and learning group that those decisions are, are local and that they're being kind of governed for us through FLT and through heads of schools, um, but that we need to document um, the, the, the decisions that we're making. So, for example, in the, the medicine programme, um, even though their, their, their case numbers of, of self-isolating students has gone down um, in discussion with PBL tutors, they've made a decision to continue online PBL. Um, so we are, as I said, we're, we're making those decisions locally and tracking them so that if we get to a kind of appeals and complaints later down the line, we can be very clear about why we made the decisions that we did. Um, 
and ensuring that they are in the kind of best interests of both our staff and students. Um, some of the work that's also done, the, the heads of teaching and learning in schools um, have been working with teams to consolidate our student support desks. Um, so because the footfall on campus is very low, uh, we want to try and um, minimise the, the number of staff that we're bringing on whilst also maintaining face-to-face uh, -face support where it's necessary. Uh, we've consolidated into the Stockford, build, Stockford building particularly um, and thank you to the, the team in, in SMS who are fielding queries for some of the other schools and we also have a small team in Jean McFarlane that we're keeping under review uh, depending on footfall uh, and that's similar to how the other faculties have done as, as we look at the tiers and, and look to kind of move to hubs that can deal with a broader um, set of queries rather than needing to have um, support for every single area. Um, a lot of the, the discussion is continuing around our planning for semester two. There's work happening around timetabling uh, and we're expecting uh, further announcements around our intentions for semester two and our approach to semester two probably next week. Lectures, large lectures will continue to be online uh, and the guidance that we're kind of giving more generally to our programmes is that we need to be able to plan to be at around tier two. So that would be having a blended approach, but looking to have a kind of aspirational two hours uh, a week face to face, if not more. But the, the really important aspect will be our ability to flex between the tiers so that we can pull back into tier three um, if that becomes necessary and be really um, careful about thinking around how we deliver ILOs. I guess some of the, the challenges and Darry and I are talking about these are, are going to be around when we're getting students into project labs um, uh, around capacity and, and making sure that both postgraduate research taught and undergraduate students are, are getting the, uh, the access and supervision and, and opportunities that we would normally expect them to have. Um, as Vicky said, a lot of um, discussions still around Christmas um, and the support that will be available for students who can't go home as well as making sure that we're clear about guidance for students whether they can. Uh, and then in terms of the, the, the blended teaching approach, so um, programmes have been doing a lot of work in recent weeks around student um, staff liaison committees and hearing from students around their feedback. Uh, there's a survey centrally around welcome and induction and BMH scored very well in terms of the welcome and induction activities that our programmes and teams provided. Uh, so thank you to, to those who were involved in those activities. Uh, there's been a lot of positive responses from students to the online and blended, blended approach. Um, I think one of the things that we accept that students are struggling with, particularly our first years, is around structure um, for their day and for their week um, because we know that they jump from kind of uh, higher um, into higher education and more self-directed um, learning is hard and so having that lack of structure in their timetable is challenging. So we're working on that and our academics are are doing more to have kind of academic advising and one-to-one -one contacts um, and there have been in general very positive responses to the to the online teaching I think where we've just had podcasts put online that has created some negative feedback uh, and the e-learning team are continuing to support academic staff with their approaches and also particularly kind of bespoke with solutions to accessibility issues um, that uh, some of our students are facing um, so I think those are the, the main things from our kind of perspective. Okay, thanks Helen. Um, I'll just pass to Darren in a minute, but just um, to remind people, if you do have any questions, if you pop them in the, the chat function, or if you want to raise your hand and, and um, ask a question directly, that's fine too. Darian. Thanks Vicky. Uh, so um, in terms um, of returning to campus for research, um, at the current Department for Education Tier 3 and as we move to the new national restrictions, um, the research that we've returned through Phase 1 to Phase 3 research um, will continue. Um, and there's been a recent uh, announcement that's been circulated that provides guidance um, to PIs and supervisors um, around needing to still complete um, Phase 3 applications for um, returning to campus for new projects um, for Phase 3. And that's for staff at PGRs and undergraduate project students um, for PIs and supervisors to complete. Um, there's also guidance as part of that announcement as to how um, a PI might add uh, people to existing projects who have returned to campus. So that announcement does provide sort of clarity on who should do what uh, when, when they're looking at returning uh, staff to campus. 
Uh, with the announcement, uh, we also included uh, the planning for future lockdowns um, and the overarching principle, uh, irrespective of the Department for Education tier or a move to the new national restrictions, um, is that uh, we will continue to do research safely and following government guidance um, and that we're looking to protect the research that we've returned. Um, this is in partnership with, with Helen and the teaching and learning team so that any uh, planning that we do or prioritisation maps onto the priority areas um, for, for teaching and learning. And uh, it's also been aligned to the Department for Education tiers. Um, as Vicky noted, uh, where we will see an impact on research would be um, the patient facing uh, research would need to be paused if we move to Department for Education tier four. And I'm working with April Lockyer and Lynn McCrane, my team, uh, just regarding where we sit if we're in a national, in the new, sorry, if I'm going to say lockdown, in the new national restrictions, but we're at Department for Education tier three, how that sits with pausing the patient facing research. So we're looking for clarity there, uh, which we, we will have before Thursday to circulate. Um, but if we do need to pause patient facing research, um, there will still be a mechanism for approval through heads of school if there's an ethical reason where we, why we would not want to pause a particular project um, irrespective of government, government guidance. As part of the planning for future lockdowns, um, uh, thank you to Caroline Grimshaw and Fiona Marriage who have worked on a process for quickly shutting down labs safely, but also uh, accompanying that, how we can reopen labs safely. Now, as I've noted, the the overarching principle is to maintain our phase one to phase three research. But if we were in a position where we were where we had to close buildings, um, that's that's where this document comes into place in terms of where we might want to cease activity in a particular building or look to um, move to only phase one and phase two research. But um, the intention would be that we we continue with uh, the research that is returned to campus. Um, in terms of uh, standard operating procedures, um, the university um, reopening group, which is now called the campus management group, is preparing um, uh, standard operating procedures around the movement between department for education tiers. And alongside that, uh, we're preparing an FBMH guide to activity, um, which we would expect across the different tiers. So those are, those are being worked on. And my understanding is that that the university level um, guidance will be uh, ready this week. Um, and that's, that's my update across uh, the protocols for reopening and uh, research. Okay, thanks very much. Um, there aren't any questions um, at the moment. Um, so if I can move on to Heather, who's going to give us just a bit of an update on uh, some of the, the wellbeing uh, resources that we have and just remind us about where we are with that. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm actually going to be looking off some uh, a set of slides that um, I've been sent by my colleague, Gemma Dale, who, who leads on wellbeing for HR. Uh, and I can liaise with the and speak them to, to circulate uh, some or all of these um, uh, later on. Um, so what she's saying is that, that there are three main teams or strands to, to wellbeing across the university. There's UOM Sport, uh, which offers exercise classes, clubs, societies, events and so on. That's for staff and students. There's Staff Wellbeing, which offers webinars, manager training, um, some self-directed materials. And then there's a counselling service and their focus is more around mental health support for staff and students. So in terms of the classes, um, what she said, I don't know if anybody, anybody engages in these, I have to confess, <laughs> I don't do, I am not. should be more active than I am, but um, there we go. Um, she said it, it's worth keeping a check on your social feeds, so Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, um, because uh, the situation is changing obviously. So face-to-face -face activities um, will end on Thursday in line with the new lockdown. But um, she says there's an, a new schedule on its way and where they can um, live stream classes via Zoom or activities via Zoom, uh, that's going to be the case. So, so there will still be some sort of provision there. In terms of the staff wellbeing um, pages, and I think we sent a link around to this in a recent, I think it might have been Vicky's um, weekly message, but we, again, we can reissue that. There's a, there is a large range of resources. Um, 
um, I would encourage people to, to, to use those. I think that there's probably something for everybody that, um, and you can just dip in and out um, that there are sort of shorter things, longer term things. Um, but, there's, you know, there are videos, there are well-being uh, lectures. And if you miss those, there are recordings, there's podcasts, guides and so on. And that, that site is being regularly updated. And in terms of <clears throat> if you look on that, what's coming up um, for November, there is Men's Health Month in November. There are sessions on developing personal resilience for change, which are running regularly throughout November and December. There are well-being through winter webinars, desk pilates, and uh, a December well-being lecture, which focuses particularly on well-being during the festive season. So those are just some of the things that are available. Also coming up, um, is a new mental health awareness campaign to make sure that all staff uh, know the signs and symptoms of poor mental health. And it looks like that's going to be called Compassionate Colleague. Um, and for managers, there was also some e-learning material on mental health by staff uh, learning and development. Um, sorry, just bear with me a sec. I clicked on the wrong thing there. There's also something available um, through staff learning development called Mindset Coaching. So this um, is focusing on how to thrive, on resilience, mindfulness, there's a stress test in there. Uh, and that, I, I don't, I must confess, I don't know the detail of it, but it looks like it incorporates some one-to-one -one coaching. The counselling service have a range of, of, of sort of um, workshops available, things like mindfulness mediation, challenging and helpful thinking habits, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and again, those are, those are sort of available online and, and regularly updated. And then uh, just one final thing to mention is something called Together All, uh, as in well, that's one word, Together All. Um, and this is an online 24-7 platform. It's anonymous and confidential, um, but you can log in and, and it's an anonymous community where you can sort of, people can support each other. It's accessible 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, one thing that I was sort of, uh, we picked up in a conversation between myself and Alison Howarth was that there has been talk of a buddy system and um, Gemma Dale did mention that recently when she visited HRLT. I'm not quite sure whether that's up to, but I know that is something that's being looked at. Um, and and the, the only thing I'd say is if you have any ideas of something that you think is missing or that would be helpful, by all means feed those in either to your manager, to your HR partner, to myself, and, and we can feed them back to the relevant um, group of people. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Um, I've got a comment from Jane Crosby. Thanks, Jane. Um, if people want to have a look in the chat, which um, is recommending the University Wellbeing blog as well. And Jane's put the, the link um, in there um, for anyone that hasn't already seen that. Um, and I think just to add to what Heather was saying, um, you know, you know, this is for the long haul now. I think it's really, really important that, you know, people are supporting each other, looking out for each other and using, you know, the support and the, the resources that the university has um, has available. I know that um, people are talking about their, their, their well-being and, and um, you know, some of the challenges and how they're dealing with that them, themselves. Um, and, um, you know that's that's really good i think that we're that we're having those conversations but it is really really important that people kind of stay well and healthy we've all got our own personal kind of challenges with 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 how we're working at the moment and everything that's going on and the the stresses and, and pressures that uh, people are under but you know we're we're here to support each other as as a as a university community and a faculty community and it's really important that we we enable that um, to, to happen um, and I think the other thing I would say is is if you don't feel that that support is there please let somebody else know um, I know that myself and the other members of the the leadership team would all be happy to to hear that it's really important that we all support each other and that we um, that we don't have people really struggling and not feeling that they they're able to talk to somebody so that's really really important um, 
Okay, um, and we will, um, I think, send those slides out and make them available on um, faculty sites. I think that will be really helpful just as a reminder of, uh, of, of, of uh, where we are and, and what we've got and probably put some of the links to, to social media and, um, and, and other, other sources of support there um, as well. Okay, um, so just wanted to um, ask Ben Goldblum if he can give us a quick update just on where we are in terms of um, student numbers and, a, and a, maybe a, um, a first look at um, applications for, for 2021. Yes, we're into that already. Ben? Of course. So um, in terms of the students that have actually turned up and registered, um, undergrad, in all three schools are over target both home and overseas so as long as they they stick and they don't all disappear off and decide not to come back for semester two um, we should be in a, a relatively um, strong position going forward on undergraduate uh, postgraduate um, we're still a little bit behind um, in terms of complete registrations um, so for the uh, on postgrad for the majority um, of schools for home they are over so biological sciences and health sciences are over target um, medical sciences are, are slightly under target um, on home on international the three schools are, are are down on complete registrations but once we take into partial registrations into account um, then biological sciences and health sciences are there or thereabouts and medical sciences are slightly down so Overall, a much more positive uh, picture than we were expecting. Um, again, that sort of is based on the assumption that they all stick around for semester two and they pay their second and third instalments um, of their tuition fees. So, so in terms of um, the work that everyone put in last year, um, that's hopefully really paid off um, and hopefully we can cope with, with the capacity issues and, and teaching them all. Um, in terms of applications for 2021, we're past the med, um, deadline for medicine and dentistry and our home applications um, are slightly up for, for medicine and dentistry, um, home and overseas. For biological sciences and health sciences, um, it's a bit early, um, but applications are looking relatively healthy. Biological sciences home are slightly down and health sciences home are slightly down. But that also is hidden a little bit by the EU students not counting in those figures anymore. So I'd need to look at those EU figures to see um, how much of the drop is, is because of those not being in there. Um, and likewise, our overseas figures are up, um, but that is probably because the figures are counted there. So overall, um, on last year's performance, relatively positive. On this year's performance going for 2021, it's looking relatively healthy, but it is very, very early. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention um, briefly, and again, if you've got questions, this is, this is fine, is just, um, I'll, I'll, I'll probably get a, a sigh in response to this, um, SEP. Um, so I think people will be aware that um, there has been uh, officially a, a pause on, on SEP. Um, but that doesn't mean that nothing's been happening and, and um, some of you hopefully will have seen the announcement that we have done the um, upgrades to campus solutions so there has and that's um, making some um, real differences to the way in which people people work and alongside that we are now populating the bridging structure for the uh, admissions teams um, and many of you will be, be aware of um, the opportunities that that's put in place. We are just um, about, to, we've been doing quite a lot of work just to assess where we're at with SCP and the work that we, we need to do and there will be more information becoming available over the next couple of weeks um, just around where we are on, on SCP and the work that's being done. I think the key thing to say is that we are still working through moving towards um, a more standardized uh, structure that will enable us to make best use of the new systems and um, refine processes that we want to bring in. Um, but we will, um, we will give, give you more information about that, but I just wanted to, to, to flag 
um, that um, we are starting to, to look again um, in a bit more detail at, at SEP. Um, so um, we did have a, a, um, a question that was uh, submitted before the uh, session, which um, I will read out. Uh, and it's a question from Dr. Kate Vaughan, um, who's a senior research program manager in cancer sciences, um, who wanted to ask us to clarify why there's no promotion process for PS staff. Um, she knows there isn't one, but she's not sure what the justification is when there are promotion opportunities for both academic and research staff. Um, and that she, with other colleagues, um, is currently creating a framework of career and development opportunities of project managers at the university, which I've seen some of the work on and, and looks really, really good. Uh, that's not part of the question. Um, but she notes that a lack of promotion opportunity makes it difficult to make a compelling case for skilled project managers to have a career um, at the university. So I'm going to ask um, Heather to, to comment on this and I'll probably come back on it. But essentially the question is about why we don't have the same sort of promotion process for PS staff as we have for academic and research staff. Okay, thanks Vicky. Uh, well, first of all, I think it's a good question, Kate. And um, if I had time, I could probably write an essay on it because there's uh, quite a lot to unpack there. I think actually it's, it's quite complex in, in a way. And what I'm going to say isn't necessarily a formal position from the university. I've not spoken to SLT, for example. Obviously, we, we've only just had the question through. Um, so I, I think it reflects my experience since I've been here and, and, and my, my thoughts, but I, but I would be surprised if they're not shared um, by, by, by others. Um, so I, I'm go, I'll try and respond brie briefly, but as I say, I think, I think there is a lot to it. Um, but so apologies if I don't articulate this perfectly, but there are two main observations that occur to me. Um, the first of which is around, you know, is having a promotions process for PS staff the right thing to do just because it exists for academic and research staff? And second point or observation, at the risk of giving away my answer to the first, if we don't have that, you know, well, what do we have in, in place? So on the first point, I've worked in HR for all of my career, so that is 32 years now, exactly half of which um, has been at University of Manchester, so it's my 16th anniversary tomorrow. Um, and there, there's some good things about that, but there are some bad things. So bad for my team in that there hasn't been any, any turnover um, uh, in terms of my role. Uh, but, and the other, but the other half of my experience is, is at a, a mix of large private sector organisations, the NHS and a very short stint to MMU. And it, until I joined MMU, which was back in 2002, I had never come across the concept of promoting people without there being a vacancy. And I'm very sure this is unique to higher education. And in fact, I, I did try, um, you know, doing some, some very brief research. And, and you can't, other than possibly the civil service, um, I, I'm not aware that this, that this sort of, I think it's quite a strange thing to happen, but, 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 but that it happens anywhere else. So I don't think that having a process whereby each year a proportion of people could effectively change grade and therefore job content would work for the PS in the best interest of the organisation or indeed for those who weren't promoted and might be impacted by having to pick up work of some of the people who have been promoted. I think where you've got a sort of a, a clearly defined organisation structure, the, the impact could be quite chaotic. Um, as I say, that, and you may or may not disagree with me, but that's, that's my, my gut feeling that it's not the right way to go in terms of the PS. Um, as I mentioned, I've been here some time now, and during that time, I have run quite a number of sessions around career development because I used to specialise on that in, 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 a, in a previous organisation, and some of you might have, here might have attended those. And my observation through those, but also through working here in HR, for the last 16 years is that there is a lot of scope for people to develop their careers here and I know many people in a wide range of roles, functions, different levels, different parts of the university who have done exactly that and I think there are a number of things that, that 
that are available in the university that help facilitate that. Um, and that's a workshop in its own right. And in fact, we did have a couple of workshops planned um, coming out of the staff survey for March and June, but unfortunately we had to cancel those due to lockdown. And my feeling has been that, that those workshops, uh, which would help people explore these sorts of things, really need to be face to face, but actually in light of where we are now and where we might be for, you know, who knows, um, I will have a look at those and see if that's something that we can offer, you know, via, via a Zoom workshop. So I think, so I think that there, that there is plenty of scope and I, and I know that to be true. I, I, know, I know many people who have developed, been able to develop their careers. It's also clear to me that we can't possibly hope to meet the career aspirations of, of every member of staff. And for some people, for example, if you're in quite a specialist role, um, and HR being one example, the opportunities to promote it to the next level will diminish sooner or later, the more, the more senior you, you get up the, the career ladder. And then it's a question for me personally of weighing up the options um, and, and doing that in a holistic way. Um, you know, what does that mean? What does this role mean versus a, a role somewhere else in the context of, of what it brings to my life? So for me, if the only important thing was um, to be the next level up, which would be either deputy HR director or HR director, I'd have left here a long time ago, um, either, either to go to, another, to an HRD role or to go somewhere where there was more chance of getting that role. Um, but, you know, that isn't the only thing that's important to me. There are many other things that, that being here gives me that, that tick other boxes, but don't give me that, that next step up on the, on the career ladder. And that's for each individual to make a judgment as to what's right for them um, overall. And it might be for, for some people on balance that actually there are better opportunities outside of the university. Um, and, and I'm not encouraging you to leave, but you, you know, that's the decision you, you come to taking all of these things into account. Uh, and so some turnover in that respect is relatively normal. I think one of the issues that we, we, we probably do have here is that actually I think our turnover is quite low. So those promotion opportunities don't arise as often as we would like. And I think it particularly in the current circumstances, you know, those, those are even, even more constrained. Um, but I, you know, th there's a lot more that could be said, Kate, and, and yeah, we, we will try and offer some things on, uh, you know, via Zoom so that people who were booked onto those workshops and anybody else that wants to attend can have some way of having a, a further conversation around this, but and it is quite an individual thing. Um, but hopefully that's gone some way to addressing the question. But Vicky, I don't know whether you've got any more formal view in terms of, you know, well, why haven't we got it for, for the PS? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, thank, thanks, Heather. I'm, I'm going to see if Kate wants to, to come, come back on this, but I think I, I would just add to that, that I, I suppose, you know, if you go back a long time in HE, there was a promotion process for professional services staff. I have to say, in another university in the Russell Group, I was on the panel that dealt with that, and the lack of equity and transparency in that process was absolutely awful. Um, and when we moved to the, the system that we have, the grading system that we have now, that was when PS promotion stopped and it was very much across the sector, clearly done on the basis, and some people will agree with this and some people won't, that there are roles that are at particular grades and therefore if you wish to progress, then you move to a role in, in that way, you move to a role in a higher grade because the role reflects the activity and the work that needs doing. And that is different in professional services than it is in, in academic and, and research roles. Now, I accept that that's a particular view and there are people in a variety of roles that are probably nearer to the, the academic and research end of things where we can argue, you know, the, the, the pluses and, and, and minuses of that. Um, but that's, that's the, the situation that we, that we have um, at the university and, and in the sector. And I think we need to think about ways in which, you know, as someone's just kind of made the comment um, that this is about people being, being valued. 
and I think what you're doing in the Research Project Managers Network is really, really helpful in this. I do think there are some interesting questions to ask about the way in which we have um, quite an individualized structure of people working to a PI on a project or a group of projects and whether that's actually helpful in terms of people's um, development. And I'd be quite interested to be involved in a conversation about that as well. Um, because I, I do think there are some things which, whilst good, good in some ways, also give us some, some challenges. And I'm not sure that we are utilising the, the, the skills and experience and knowledge of some really, really good people we've got around the faculty um, in, in the best way to support both their own development and, and um, the, the faculty's performance more generally. So, as, as Heather says, uh, it, it's not straightforward this, it's very complex um, and, and there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot going on, um, but it's something that I think we're, we're, we're keen to, to, to talk about, recognising that I think the fundamental of there not being a promotion process per se for peer staff, that, that is, is not going to be something that, that, that changes. Kate, I don't know if you want to make any Yeah, comments. no, thank you. That that's all it's all very helpful and actually it's none of that is is unexpected. You know, I, I can kind of see that that some of the PS structure is, you know, you get to a certain level it, and you know that that's it. I think in terms of the project managers, we are slightly different. And when we have the academic related structure, it was perfect because that's we are kind of hybrid uh research um and and support i think it would be great to have have those sorts of conversations because um as you can imagine i mean i come under cancer so this is sort of more of the the mcrc framework of project managers whilst we link into the faculty one but we are the project managers are integral to the team science approach we are quite often co-applicants we're named on outputs but we fall under the ps um structure and therefore when we're trying to write this framework to encourage people to, to you know, bring in the best people to Manchester for project management when I'm trying to think about what what is unique and where can you go within that what tends to happen is we're training people up and then they leave or we train people up within BRC within RADnet whatever when they get to a certain point they have to look for another job in a different team and then you're back to square one and it's just something that feels a little bit bitty i know we're in a massive organization it's difficult to approach but i'd really welcome um conversations with, with yourself vicky and, and heather just to see to, to explore the scope of of how we could perhaps better address it okay yeah no happy happy to do so so I mean, if you want to you know get in touch and we can have a conversation about that that's really brilliant useful. thanks very much that's great okay Okay, um, so we haven't got any other um, questions, so I'll uh, let everybody go and get a bit of um, time back. I hope that's been helpful. I um, hope everyone continues to kind of, you know, stay well, stay safe, don't overdo it, please. Um, I know there's a lot on and it's a challenging time, um, but we all need to make time for ourselves as well as, um, you know, and, you know, doing the best for the, for the faculty and, and, and the, the team that you're in, which I know everybody um, is doing. So thank you um, for everything that you're, you're doing and um, keep safe and keep well. And I will see you all soon. Thank you very much.